the idea that it is necessarily only to develop the good that exists in man by nature is a fatal deception. And this is what the theology today is teaching, that vice is better than virtue. Precious Father in heaven, thank you for this morning once again. It's a privilege, Lord, to come before you in prayer and in the study of your word. As we open scripture and as we have our minds upon your word, may you sanctify us through your truth, for your word is truth. May you guide those that ought to come to come to listen to the bread of life. In Jesus' name, amen. I welcome you online. We are continuing with our sharing. And um, may God bless you as we shall be reading together. So go with me to John chapter 3, verse 3. John 3, 3, where we are told uh, something concerning a born again experience. Last yesterday, our scripture reading, as we know, Romans 8, Verse 7 says that the carnal heart is enmity against God and is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So the carnal heart is not subject to the law of God and it cannot be. And we realize that if it can then not be, there is a need of um, this carnal heart being changed. Uh, being from John 3 3, we did as was talking to the Nicodemus, and this is what he told him. He said that Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Just think about that. It is as simple as that. If you and I don't get born again, we cannot just, not just entering, but we cannot see the kingdom of God. Would that mean that is a, a very serious case here of being born again? But then someone will say, what are the implications of being born again? Some of the things that are revealed in a born again life are these. You go with me to First John chapter 3, and we are reading verse 7 to verse 9. First John 3, 7 to verse uh, 9 says that, Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. So he's saying, let no man deceive you or don't even deceive yourself. A man who is righteous is the one who does righteousness. So we should never have self-deception that in some way or somehow we shall have the kingdom of heaven, but sin is still somewhere in our lives. So let no one be self-deceived and let no man deceive us. Eight. He that committed sin is of the devil. So when you and I sin, we are not the Lord's, but the devil's. And it goes on to say that, For the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Amen. Yesterday we saw that, if man could be able to do something in his power, maybe by discipline, by education, by culture, by the power of the will, to have salvation, then it wouldn't need Jesus Christ to come to start to do a certain, such a deep thing like dying. Here John has said that it was because of this sin that God had to manifest, uh, Jesus had to manifest himself that he may destroy the works of the devil. There are two sides to this thing, brothers and sisters, and that is 
One side is there to convince us that we are totally wicked, desperate wicked. We are in such a worse state that we cannot even do the righteousness of God. And it is impossible for us of ourselves to do it. We are in a state whereby we need a death. We need death. That is what we need. We to die. A spiritual death, but a death which is death to sin. And then there's a need of a new life, totally new, to live. May that uh, give us a correct impression. That is one side of the matter. The second side of the matter is, it is the good news. Once uh, it, is, it seems sad and gloomy when we think about of us not being anything good, and we need to die totally. But the good side of it is that it is the good news in that the person who fully understands that fact will be able to see that, oh, God all along, this is why he has come to die for me. That is great love for me. And that good side of it, which is the good news, is there to convince our hearts of the loving kindness of God such that we now rest in him. We rest in him and let him do the works in us. And that is realized in our lives by us beholding the Lamb of God. By beholding him, by seeing his character, we are changed. That is how a death is effected in our lives. Verse 9 says, Whosoever is born of God, we have just read about the need of a born again experience that except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And yet he's saying that everyone that is born of God does not commit sin. So for you to understand if you're born of God or not, examine your life. Is sin still in your life? Is sin still in my life? For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So this consistently goes with the fact that if I'm not born again, if lack of being born again leads me to not see the kingdom of heaven, and not being born again means sinning, therefore it means whosoever will have a spot of sin cannot enter the kingdom of God. That is what she really means. Now, many times when such a scripture as this is read, we want to come, to rotate around it and say, ah, maybe John is not being so direct when it comes to us not sinning, meaning that we're not being born again. Somehow, somewhere, it may be meaning some other thing. But the scripture is plain and clear that whosoever is born of God does not commit sin because his seed remaineth in him. So this is such a Christian uh, experience we need. If we are truly born of God, this is what it results in, us not committing sin. And that is the experience God wants us to have. That is why he's saying it's the way for us to see heaven. The Savior said, according to steps to Christ, except a man be born from above. In other words, except you are born from not within you, but from above, some other power beyond you and me, unless he shall receive a new heart. You hear that? A new desires, new purposes, new motives, hmm? leading to a new life. He cannot see the kingdom of God. So it means for us to be really transformed men and women who will see the kingdom of heaven, there must be a change of heart in us, whereby the stony heart we have is removed and another heart is given. Not getting this stony heart and then manipulate it in some way and correct it, but get totally that stony heart removed, killed, and the new heart, which is of the flesh brought in, which is the heart of Jesus. That, that transformation is a mystery. And to you and me, we cannot fully comprehend it. But that is what God really does in us. And we ought to just by faith believe it. And that would be the beginning. So 
there's a new need a need of new desires are our desires really uh, motivated in the divine field are our purposes really holy are our motives the motives that are pure leading to a new life and he says he cannot see the kingdom of God if such is missing. Now, now listen to this. The idea that it is necessarily only to develop the good that exists in man by nature is a fatal deception. And this is what the theology today is teaching, that vice is better than virtue. In other words, if you are not fornicating, well, you're better than someone who is fornicating. And by that, you're kind of somehow a good person because you're not fornicating, and that is Christianity. Inspiration says that righteousness of Christianity goes beyond that. You may not be fornicating, you may not be smoking cigarette, you may not be stealing, but when in your heart, even if you have a lot of good action surface, but when your heart does not have the transforming power of God in you, still that cannot fit you for the kingdom of heaven. So it's a false idea to think that it is only sufficient to develop the good that exists in, in man by nature. Ellen White says that is a fatal deception. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, and still this, uh, John 3, 7, it says that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, what does that mean? If the natural man, that is you and me, we don't receive the natural the things of God, what does it mean? It means for us to receive them, we must cease being natural men and start being spiritual men, which is by faith in Christ's transforming power. And that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them. You see, the language being used here is resembling that of Romans 8, 7, that the carnal heart is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be, and yet says that the natural man cannot receive God's things, neither can he know them. In other words, if we cannot even know them, what next for us? We need to die and be born again. Death to sin dying in Christ and be resurrected in a newness of Christ. This is a total transformation being talked about here. The good in you and the good in me being developed and manufactured in a good way, that is not going to bring the life of Christ. There must be a new thing brought in and this old thing dead, killed, put to death. Otherwise, if what is in me that is good would be manipulated and uh, and uh, styled in some way to benefit righteousness in me or salvation, Jesus wouldn't have need to die. By the fact that God, Jesus Christ, had to die, who am I to think I can, I'm, I can live righteousness without death? There is a death that Jesus Christ saved us from, and that is the eternal death. If we believe in him. But that eternal death is the death to our lives, like us to die eternally and not live. But the death which he died on the cross, there is a portion which was dying an eternal death. He died that in our state. That is to everyone that believes. This is what the gospel is, brethren. And that what he died at the cross of Calvary, that the, what died there, he was putting sin to death eternally. And when I believe in that, also I die with him, you see? And when I die with him, the death to my sin is supposed to be eternal as well. That is, if I have the complete faith of Jesus he had when he was dying on the cross of Calvary. And, and what, mind you, if we resurrected, then what next for you and me? If we believe in him, then our sin is purged away. And therefore, there is no sin holding us because of belief in him. And as he resurrected, because no sin held him, even you and I resurrect him in him, in the newness of life, because there's no sin holding in us. Do you realize that? To be born again, 
there must be no sin living in our lives. Because if sin is living, that means you have you have no opportunity to resurrect again. You see that? Dead in trespasses. That is what it means. So a carnal heart cannot be subject to God's law. A natural man cannot know the things that are spiritual. There is altogether a need of a new system in us. What we need to understand, brothers and sisters, is our need is that we totally need Christ, not 95%, and somehow, some way, we can do the other one by our means. No, but we need him fully, totally, to the extent that we don't have to live anymore. We need to die and him to live. If you and I ever expect righteousness, that is the only way out. So if sin still lives in your life, and still, sin still lives in me. We are not yet born again. That is what First John has told you. That's what inspiration is telling us. So we need something beyond us. To you and me who understand this point well, you can realize that this is beyond you and me. It's beyond us. I every day sin. Many times I sin even in my thoughts. How can I really be that holy, committing no sin? And that's what means that I'm being born again. That can bring conviction to you and me that, oh man, this is impossible for me. And amen, that is the fact. Jesus wants us to understand that in clarity and understand that it's only us to go on our knees and pray and study his word. Behold him in his word and in nature. Behold him enough. Rest in Jesus, and then we will see his works working in us. But there's no other way except by studying his word prayerfully and behold him. I think you get the point. So he says that, marvel not that I said unto thee. He was telling Nicodemus, do not uh, complain that I'm telling you, you need to be born again. Even us, as we study here, First John has told us that, unle uh, that if you're born of God, you can't commit sin. Don't complain about that. That's the reality. To be born again, it means that you, have, you are overcoming the life of sin. Don't complain about that. So marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Of Christ it is written, in him was life, amen. So life is in who? Is in Jesus. Life is not in us. We are dead. We forfeited our lives to the devil. When Adam and Eve sinned, they gave up the right to life. That right was taken by Satan. You see, from, from Adam and Eve. So since Adam and Eve sinned, they no longer have life. No wonder that's why Satan put, took the prerogatives of him being the king of the earth. But was he the king or the prince? No, it was Adam who was the prince. So Adam lost everything to the devil, including life. So Adam does not have his own life. We don't have life. And scripture says, according to John chapter 1, verse 4, and Acts chapter 4, verse 12, that in him who, Jesus, was life, and the life was the light of men. Amen. The only name under heaven, the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. If any of you and I will ever receive salvation, it's only by the name of Jesus. Sometimes we may speak this word, but when we don't really go to the core understanding of it, we may say it's by the name of Jesus alone that we are saved. But when we are just saying it on a superficial uh, version of understanding things, the reality is it is down that name alone that we can be saved. And if it is the only name that we can be saved, it means there's nothing totally in you that can bring redemption 
and we need to accept that. Until we understand that, that will be the beginning of our salvation. It is not enough, listen, it's not enough to even understand the loving kindness of God. You know, it's not enough to see the benevolence, but like, wow, such a loving God, such a generous God, such a father who is so tender. It's not enough to only see that. And she goes on to say, it is not enough to discern the wisdom and justice of his law. To see that, to see that it is founded upon the eternal principle of love. Paul the Apostle saw all this, he saw all that when he cried, I consent unto the law that it is good. The law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good in Romans chapter 7, 16. But then he said, but he added in the bitterness of his soul anguish and despair, I am carnal, sold and a sin. He longed for the purity, the righteousness to attain. Mind you, here we are talking about Paul, a man that was a powerful preacher. But he is crying that he sees sin in himself. When he wants to do good, he does not do it. And the bad he does not want to do, he ends up doing that. This is Paul, a man experienced in the word of God. Then who are we who think in one way or the other that, oh, you know, because you see God is love, etc. Somehow, somewhere I'm good. The point, brethren, that inspiration is trying to tell us is that we need a power beyond us. And if we can just understand that, understand that we are totally nothing and we need Jesus, not in morning devotion only, not in evening devotion only, but every hour of the day, every minute of the day, that will be the beginning of our rest in Christ. And that is why he said in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, that come unto me all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Rest in Jesus. Let him do the work. That's what God wants us to understand. Because in our works, there is no total, totally no hope at all. You see? Our only help, we can be saved. And why we are studying this is to help us understand And that fact. Closing the righteousness to which in himself he was powerless to attain and cried out, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Such is the cry that has gone up from abandoned hearts in all lands and in all ages. To all, there is but one answer. There is but one answer. John 1, 29, behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Amen. What does it mean? It means to spend quality time with God, studying his word, opening the scriptures, not with the pride of being so informed, but prayerfully desiring that those words may bring transformation in your life and in my life. And thinking about him, taking time with him, talking with him in prayer consistently, looking not to your sins and how you're so weak, but looking at him. And by that, you will see transformation in your life. That will be power working from above. Amen. May God bless you. Let us uh, have a prayer. Precious Father in heaven, thank you. Indeed, born again, experiencing us. Help and we shall see the kingdom of God. Events are passing before us. The sandal is right at the door. 
It would be a waste for us to reach it when we are not born again. Save us, we pray. We say this not because we have lost hope. We say it not because we are discouraged, but thank you. Indeed, your word encourages us that it is by that name of Jesus that we are saved. Amen. In Jesus' name.